Uh, welcome to the uh, BFS event of uh, icing testing of helicopter, the Bell 525 and NFC uh, capabilities. My name is Stephanie and today I will give the introduction of the BFS uh, Montreal Ottawa chapter. And uh, here there is uh, our team. Uh, Ken is the chapter publicity and uh, region director of Americas. Chantal is the Vice President of uh, Americas. Tuba is the Chapter President. Was our Chapter VP. Mathieu, uh, Education Chair. Uh, Olivier is uh, our Membership Chair. Uh, we have also a student group, uh, the McGill uh, VFS Chapter. Anna Maria, who is a Chapter Officer, our newest member. And then uh, Stefan, myself, and Frédéric, we are Chapter Officers. And uh, Maxime is a Chapter uh, Web Director. And uh, our mission is to increase uh, interest in uh, vertical uh, flight across uh, uh, Canada. And uh, we would like uh, also to, uh, our mission is to create a platform to facilitate um, uh, networking and collaboration regarding vertical flight. And we provide uh, learning uh, opportunities through uh, conferences. And if you have any question or you would like to join us, uh, you can uh, reach out to us and uh, join our uh, community. Uh, we uh, uh, perform multiple events throughout the year, and 2021 and 2022 we performed some webinars at uh, Bell uh, at CAE. In April 2023 we had uh, an event at Pratt & Whitney. In uh, May 2023 we had an event at uh, CAE. Uh, this, uh, not so many weeks ago we had a student competition at uh, McGill in uh, February. And in November 2023 we had a conference uh, of, uh, regarding alternative source of energy. And uh, now we'll give, uh, um, uh, I will ask uh, Tua to come on stage and he will give an introduction about that. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Stephanie. Salut tout le monde. Pour ceux et celles qui ne me connaissent pas, mon nom est Tuva. Je suis le directeur principal pour des programmes de développement ici chez Bell. Uh, je vais parler brièvement uh, juste une introduction nouvelle. Je sais qu'il y a plusieurs d'entre vous qui viennent d'ici, uh, mais je vais le faire pareil. Hello everyone, my name is Tuva, I'm the uh, program manager for development programs here at Bell. I'm also the president of the Vertical Flight Society, Montreal Ottawa chapter. Very thankful for all of you all to be here today. I'm going to give a very brief overview of Bell. I know a lot of you come from here, so a lot of you don't. Um, so just to understand a little bit of what we do. Um, so I just want to start out by telling you that here um, at Bell Mirabel, uh, we do a little bit of everything. We've got um, engineering development, we've got production, we've got flight testing, uh, we've got deliveries, um, and we're part of a, a big family, a multinational corporation, right? Uh, we're, our, our facilities are located all over the world, um, principally, uh, principally in Texas, uh, where we've got our military business, um, as well as production centers for our rollers and drives components, and a lot of our uh, technical fellows like uh, Dr. Al Brand, who uh, came out to talk to us today. Um, in Mirabel, we've got our commercial center of excellence. So a lot of our commercial business is centered around uh, the hub right here. Um, we also have offices out in Singapore. We've got a warehouse out in Calgary. Um, and just to give you an idea, we are truly global. Um, so whether it's our uh, centers of excellence developing helicopters or our uh, our manufacturing centers supporting our customers out in Singapore, out in you know wherever uh, our customers operating, uh, we are there. Um, our Canadian footprint also spans uh, across the country. Our principal footprint really here is uh, is in Merville, but we also have a service center and an operation out in Calgary for our, our warehousing. Um, so we are part of a global conglomerate known as Textron. Bell is about 24% of uh, Textron's overall business, um, and the other sections include, uh, you know, aviation, Textron Aviation, uh, which produces the well-known Cessna brand, for example. Uh, in terms of revenue, uh, our, our commercial revenue is about $3 billion, uh, so almost half of Bell's overall revenue um, comes from uh, this division right here. And if we just talk about our Center of Excellence, it's led by uh, Michael Noe here in Mirabel, who's our uh, Vice President and uh, General Manager, and you can see some of the other members of the executive team of Mirabel. Uh, we're about 1,500 employees here um, across a very large site. 
Um, we are the one and only helicopter manufacturer in Canada. Uh, don't let people tell you different. Um, in terms of, again, operations in Maribel, right? A lot of people come to Maribel and they think, hey, you guys produce helicopters, uh, you know, you maybe do some delivery, you do nothing else. That's not true. The engineering development or the heart of the engineering development on the commercial side comes out of Maribel. Um, so whether you're talking about uh, new product introduction, um, uh, you know, uh, chief engineers are out of Maribel for different products. Um, flight testing is out of here. The, uh, our, our, test, our mechanical tests, our avionics tests, a lot of that on the commercial side is done out of the Maribel facility. Uh, we've got strong relationships across the country. Uh, so uh, you'll, you'll see the Canadian Coast Guard proudly flying our products. Uh, we've got a long-lasting relationship with the uh, DMV as well. They've been flying the Griffin for probably well over 40, 50 years. Uh, and we're doing an upgrade project with them as we speak um, on site today. We also have an operation in Calgary, which I will get into. Um, in terms of being a development hub um, and a manufacturing hub here in Canada, we also support a lot of local businesses. So a lot of our supply chain comes out of, uh, of Canadian uh, suppliers. So we do about $850 million, let's say, of economic impact to the country, uh, which is quite a large amount. Um, and if we just want to talk a little bit about our products, I mean, a lot of you know our products already, from the smallest, the 505, uh, to the largest, the 525, uh, which I was going to talk about in a few minutes here. Um, you know, Bell's really, uh, we have a product in every single product class, essentially, on the commercial side. Um, and these are you know, just some of the general missions that we do, having helicopter emergency services, utility, power public. Um, you name it, if a customer needs a vertical lift mission, Bell is there. Uh, and, and just to leave you off, uh, you know, uh, this, this slide is it's interesting, it's, all, it's a bunch of different things, but Bell is always innovating. That's, that's really what this, this slide is talking about. Uh, we started off as an aircraft company, believe it or not, before we morphed into a helicopter company a long time ago. So we are always at the cutting edge of new technology and uh, trying to bring that to market. Um, so if you leave here with one thing, um, I want you to remember that in Mirabel, we do more than just manufacturing, we do development as well. So thank you very much, and I'll pass it over to you first. Merci toutefois pour cette présentation à propos de Bell. So, uh, before going forward with our two next uh, speakers, I would like to answer, uh, and I would like to introduce them and also to introduce the, the main topic of tonight's presentation. Uh, so, for the development of a, a rotor craft to be able to fly into not known icing condition, uh, there is like different methodologies that can be applied. Uh, one of the examples is, is shown on the screen. Uh, from the left to the right, we start from a low uh, accurate <coughs> methodology with a low cost and a low risk to the right with the, uh, with the, te uh, the technique or methodology or test that will have higher accuracy for the result but also obviously higher cost and also higher risk for the, uh, for the project. For, so if we start from the left, usually like uh, during the development, we can do some uh, analytical and numerical simulation. After that, we'll sometime go forward and do a, a test on the sub component <coughs> and also on sensor to validate the ice shape uh, on some critical part of the aircraft by doing tests in wind tunnel by testing the critical part of the sensor. And after that, we can go forward by doing flight tests into artificial icing, as shown uh, on the screen. And finally, the, the last test, or usually the, the flight test into uh, natural icing. Uh, uh, obviously, tonight we'll not have the time to cover all of those subjects. Um, but we'll, we'll have two presentations one from uh, David Orchard from the NRC, will present the NRC icing testing uh, cap capabilities, will be, uh, will be the first presentation. And after that, we'll move forward with uh, uh, our brand with a senior tech, tech fellow at Bell who will present a flight test into uh, icing, uh, uh, artificial icing for the Bell uh, 525. So let me introduce <coughs> our first uh, speaker. So David Ochard will receive his PhD in experimental study of heat transfer over drag reducing ripplet from the University of Nottingham in 1997 and went to the work in the field of high, uh, supersonic and hypersonic aerodynamics. 
Part of his research was performed at the DRDC Valcatier. He joined the NRC in 2001 when he, was, he, he has worked on numerous projects in the aerodynamic lab and has been facility manager for the 1.5 meter dry and the 9 meter low speed wind, wind tunnel. For the last 12 years, he has concentrated on aircraft icing research within the altitude icing wind tunnel. He is currently the lead of the aviation project development and subsection program at the NRC and chair of the SAE Aerospace Icing Technology Committee. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, so, uh, David Orchard, Senior Research Officer at the NRC. And uh, so tonight I'm going to talk about the NRC's icing capabilities and try and do what we do some justice with uh, what I can cover in the time. So, but first of all, I'm going to, you know, I have to, to help them, I do it first. Here we go. There we go. So, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, an overview of the NRC. Um, this is uh, an organisation, the National Research Council, which is uh, spread across the country. We're mostly in, um, in Ottawa, the main sites are in Ottawa, where I come from. Um, but we are spread across the country from Newfoundland out to, uh, to Vancouver and uh, Vancouver Island. Um, we have 14 research centres and 24 uh, laboratory locations. And uh, we also uh, organise the IRAP programme, so providing advice and funding for small, small to medium sized enterprises for innovation and projects. Yeah, I'm going to get this right. And so uh, this is how the NRC is organised. So we have a structure that uh, covers quite a lot of disciplines. So from on the left-hand side, we have transport and manufacturing, which is where the aerospace uh, research centre fits. And then we also have engineering, some life sciences, emerging technologies, and as I mentioned, the industrial research assistance programme for funding and innovation ideas for SMEs. Thank you. There we go. So first of all, I'm going to give a, a brief overview of uh, the Aerospace Research Centre. So we have five different uh, research labs uh, under this under the under Aerospace. So we have structures and materials, uh, aerospace manufacturing, which is based mostly here in Montreal. Uh, the aerodynamics lab, which is the lab that I'm a member of. Um, the propulsion lab, looking at gas, gas turbine lab, for example, looking at um, engine propulsion, etc. And also then we have the flight research lab. In the aerospace research centre, we have about 400 employees. So these are an example of some of the facilities that we have. So uh, we have five wind tunnels in the aerodynamics lab. Uh, the picture that you see there is the nine meter low speed wind tunnel that if you've been to the Ottawa airport, you would, you would have seen that. Um, we have an aerospace manufacturing facility, nine engine test cells, nine research aircraft in part of the flight research lab, full scale structural testing, and a center for air, air travel research as well which is a, a fairly new um, area that we are starting to work in. <coughs> so to get on to the icing part, I thought I'd give a, uh, a brief, inch, brief sort of history of where the NRC has been in the field of icing. So this actually uh, dates back as far uh, to the There we go. Um, this dates back to the 1930s. So there was an example of uh, curing, um, developing a, an ice protection system using engine exhaust uh, that was fed along the leading edge of wings and propellers. Um, also, this uh, worked or, uh, further development on electro thermo ice protection systems in the late 1930s. This uh, involved a, a thermal, uh, an electrically conducting rubber that was cemented to the leading edge of. Uh, Panel blades, and the optimization of the um, electrothermal wise protection system was uh, developed and 
trying on the, the Bell HDL4 rotor in 1952. And the picture that you see there is an example of the ice accretion on a propeller of uh, a research aircraft that was uh, active in the 1950s. Um, and this is just prior to the uh, ice protection system working, so it's, it doesn't show that it's not working very well. Uh, so this is the research aircraft that I was talking about. Uh, this is called, this was a, a Canada North Star, which was uh, referred to as the Rockcliffe Wagon. So there's an airport next to the NRC's campus in, in Ottawa. Uh, in, it's the Rockcliffe Air, Airport, and so I guess that's where it got its name. And so this was an icing research um, aircraft, so it had uh, lots of instrumentation to, uh, to measure liquid water contents, the drop size uh, in, the, in the atmosphere, um, and you can see that it has a, a large dorsal fin on the top of the fuselage, and that was to uh, look at ice accretion of uh, airfoils and looking at the development of uh, ice protection systems. And the picture that you have on the right hand side is activation of the ice protection system, that's the electrothermal uh, system I was talking about. I mean, I'm not going to be able to cover the engine icing work that we've done uh, at the NRC. It's a, an extensive uh, area of work, but, so I'm not going to be able to cover too much this evening. But these are some uh, early examples of uh, engine icing work that we did. In, uh, the, uh, the first test was uh, performed on the Junkers Jumo uh, engine in 1947, and that was done in Test Cell 5 at the Montreal Road campus at the NRC. <laughs> Then there was uh, some ice crystal testing in 1955 and also some mixed phase testing in the early 70s, mixed phase being a combination of ice crystals and liquid water, super cool liquid water. When it comes to tests um, that we have... When it comes to tests that we've done uh, with uh, aircraft helicopter icing, um, in the 1950s through to the 1980s, we had a full-scale helicopter icing rig. This was a, uh, basically a, a, a spray mask that we had that was installed and it was operated outside in the winter that could generate an icing cloud under which the helicopter could flow, fly um, about six meters down, sorry, 30 meters downstream of the array. And so then we could actually simulate icing outside this uh, had a liquid water content uh, capability up to about 0.9 grams per cubic meter and NVDs from 20 microns up to about 60. So it would fit within what we refer to as the Appendix C icing envelope quite well. Unfortunately, that was decommissioned in the 1980s, um, but it was a nice picture anyway. So, I'm going to uh, talk about the altitude icing wind tunnel, which is a facility we have in the aerodynamics lab that's used principally for testing and icing of aircraft components. Not my computer. So this is the um, this is the alt um, altitude icing wind tunnel, or referred to as AIWT. We have two test sections that can. Uh, fit in this in the test section of this tunnel, which is um, well, you can see this is the test section here on the settling chamber, and this is a wind tunnel, a, a closed circuit wind tunnel that's in the vertical plane. So it goes downstairs, goes to the fan, then comes back up through the heat exchanger, and then back through to the to the test section. With a full test section, uh, that's 57 by 57 centimeters. Uh, in cross section, and um, we can get to speeds of just over 100 meters per second when you consider a reasonable amount of blockage in the, in the, from a model. We have a high speed insert which is slightly smaller, 33 centimeters by 52, but in, with that we can go much higher mark, uh, speeds up to Mark 0.7, which is uh, necessary when we start to look at uh, tests with probes, for example. So our total temperature range, we can go down to minus 40 degrees C and up to plus 30. And because this has an altitude capability, we can 
Vac we have vacuum pumps which can uh, partially draw air from the circuit and we are able to simulate altitudes up to 40,000 feet. The spray wells are positioned uh, just at the start of the settling chamber, about 3.6 metres upstream from the start of the test section. And we have about 30 spray bars that allow us to um, produce the uh, supercooled liquid water cloud. So the tunnel was developed, uh, it was developed in the 1960s, went through various configurations up to the, uh, the current configuration is, is uh, uh, put in place in the, night, in the early 80s. And most tunnels like this have been developed with what we refer to as the appendix C icing envelope. Um, this, the, the appendix C icing envelope is sort of shown in these two graphs. Uh, we have what was referred to as the continuous maximum, which defines the liquid water content um, over a range of droplet sizes or medium, medium volumetric diameters, MVD. Um, so any, any particular combination of that will, and temperature, we can then uh, we can set our conditions in the tunnel based on the requirements uh, for product development and certification. We also have the envelope for what's called intermediate maximum, uh, which provides a much higher liquid water content, but for a shorter duration. And so basically the tunnel was developed um, with those uh, icing envelopes in mind. It's interesting to note that these icing envelopes were developed in the late 1940s and haven't changed since, and they were adopted as part of the FAA's um, Part 25, Part 27 regulations um, in 1964, I believe. Uh, a lot of other work that we do uh, is um, you saw this picture earlier, of course, surprisingly. Um, so we do a lot of work with the air data probes, uh, looking at the development of air data probes and uh, certification for flight testing. Uh, for example, PITO and PITO static probes, similar to the one you see there. Total temperature probes, actualized detectors, um, detecting when you're actually in a lighting cloud, for example, angle of attack and angle of side slip. And uh, we have developed our capabilities to be compliant with the uh, technical standard order C16A and C16B, which uh, relates to PITO probes, for example. We also have a capability to test ice protection systems, traditional ice protection systems that may use hot air. We have a hot air system, pressurized, that we can simulate um, hot air ice protection system on the inside of a wing. Um, also testing uh, electrothermal systems and then hybrid systems, which may uh, have a combination of heat and coatings, for example. The uh, images that you see there is um, this was an example of a test that we did in collaboration with NASA at Glenn, uh, looking at um, the scaling effects of ice protection systems under altitude. So the advantage of this wind tunnel is that we can simulate those altitudes so we don't have, have to scale in order to accommodate uh, the changes in heat transfer and evaporation of the icing cloud. Um, when we well at sea level. So these are these are examples of the kind of ice in shapes that we were seeing with the operation of the ice protection over in like a uh, 0018 airfoil. As I mentioned, the, the tunnel, the icing wind tunnel, and pretty much every icing wind tunnel that has been developed um, was built and designed with the Appendix C icing envelope in mind, but in 19, no, sorry, 2015, the regulations were added to by the inclusion of super cold large drop conditions. And so we have to then start to think about how do we develop our facilities to account for that. So, super cold large drops, so prior to 20, 15, the icing regulations 
were centred around for Appendix C, the icing, where the drop diameters were less than 100 microns. But there are large drops in the atmosphere, and in 1994, uh, there was an accident in uh, Ro uh, Rose Lawn, Indiana, uh, where an ATR-72 crashed, uh, following an encounter with uh, a cloud containing super cool large drops. And so this led to the inclusion of that new atmospheric condition, or that, that atmospheric condition, into the new regulations. This is an example of the kind of uh, issue that we would have with an SLD cloud. So the, the image on the right hand side is an ice accretion over a ring uh, in a typical appendix C, like small drop icing. And then the, the image on the left is uh, the kind of icing that you get with an SLD cloud. And you can see that the ice accretion occurs further back over the wing. So that's potentially outside of the ice protection region, and so you are then in an unprotected zone. You can have ice moving up outside of that, um, outside your protected region. Um, so SLD was uh, the actual SLD cloud was uh, developed or defined uh, following a series of flight tests in the. 1990s and early 2000s, and the SLD conditions were uh, split into two different <coughs> categories, so freezing drizzle, freezing rain, and then those two categories were split again into what's into a, uh, what's called freezing drizzle in and freezing drizzle out, freezing rain in, freezing rain out, and it defines the uh, it was segregated based on the MVD of that particular condition. So there's four different SLD conditions. SLD has a particular drop distribution in the cloud. So you can see that this is a drop distribution for freezing drizzle and this is for freezing rain. And it has what we refer to as a bimodal shape. So there's like two humps in the uh, drop distribution where you've got two different distinct uh, small drop and large drop in the same cloud. And so if you want to simulate that in a wind tunnel, you have to try and develop that kind of cloud, which is something we hadn't done before. So we have to match the cloud distribution, like I just mentioned, but we also have to develop a cloud which has the correct liquid water content. SLD has very low liquid water contents and um, we have to match the drop temperature of the free stream as well, which is quite difficult. And this is an example of this is an example of how we matched the red dots, or how we matched the distribution. The black lines of the distributions are given in the regulation, and the, the dots are what we managed to do in the wind tunnel, so we got fairly close. And that's the same for freezing rain. This is another issue that we have, is that because you have a short distance from the in the test section, the drops don't reach the, the right temperature by the time the larger drops don't get cooled down enough. And so we have to determine whether our drops are cold enough in order to simulate the, the true atmospheric conditions. Another challenge with doing SLD, which we're still working on. Uh, this is, I'm going to quickly go over this. So I'll just have one five minute signal. Uh, this is uh, new regulations for uh, probes, for example, uh, probes for, um, for icing. And uh, uh, concentrate on the L2 and L3 conditions where you've got the R in the class, which is the rotor class. And so this is for super cool super, uh, liquid water tests. So you have to meet these new conditions after a, as a part of a new SAE standard, as AS5562. In addition to that, we also have to account for rain. So it's a large liquid water contents, like liquid water contents up to 15 grams in some cases. And again, that has, it's, uh, applies to rotorcraft uh, air data probes. We have a capability developed in the NRC, it's called a morph genetic uh, icing code, and it works completely in 3D. 
Um, this is an example of the icing code uh, on a PTO probe. And so it's a um, stochastic approach, and so the, the icing cloud as it impacts the surface will determine based on probability of whether a drop is going to freeze or whether it's going to run on to the next part of the simulation, or, and then that calculation of freezing or running it running back is done again. And through that, you can get some really very accurate, truly 3D simulations. And this is an example of what it looks like on a um, on a wing air of well, I've got. This is I don't know if you can I don't know if you can see this. This is a, a, an example of the simulator, an ice shape that was performed using that code. So as you can see, how three dimensional the code actually is. So looking at novel ice projection systems. So. As we start looking at low power or um, systems that require ice protection but don't have the necessary power requirements, we are looking at doing um, uh, designs where we can use coatings that will reduce the ice on the, on the surface. These are particularly we're looking at low adhesion coatings and for this we've developed a test rig that can fit in the altitude ice and wind tunnels test section. And um, this test rig, it, it rotates and we ice up the coupons and then we can shed the coupons from this um, rig and then measure the other adhesion from different uh, samples and different coatings. And so this is, um, this is what happens is that the ice that the, you can see on this uh, particular example, you've got ice on the coupons at each end of the, of the arms. And then this is rotated, uh, accelerated, and as the you get to a certain RPM, these forces, radio forces, will shed the ice from the surface. And could you click on the video? It takes a while. There you go. And so you can see it's starting to rotate. And then what happens is once the ice comes off the sample, there's accelerometers in the wall and it will measure the spike and we can then see what RPM and we know the mass of the ice, we know the, the radius of the arm and then we know the RPM and then we can work out the shear force. And if you watch in the bottom right hand corner soon that you'll see the actual ice coming off of the... There you go. And so we know the RPM, now we can work out the adhesive force of that particular coating. And then you, this is a range of the kind of um, adhesive forces or shear forces that we can measure. So up to 500 kPa for a baseline met, uh, material, down to as much as little as 10 kPa for particular coatings. The problem with this is most coatings that actually perform well have durability issues. And so these are not really being accepted through in, by industry or by... Um, regulators yet, and so there's still work to do to improve the, the durability of coatings that will actually provide you a low adhesive. Uh, we've also in, uh, moved uh, recently with uh, remotely piloted aircraft systems. This has a requirement for icing uh, assessments, and so we have performed a series of tests with, use, uh, with the Transport Canada's uh, Arbitrage Task Force. This has been done over several years, including tests within the altitude ice and wind tunnel on small rotors. Uh, the, the graph that you see there is the thrust loss under an icing condition based on the type of uh, drop size in the cloud. This is a 22 inch uh, rotor that's in a, uh, on a test stand in a cold room that we've developed to, for this particular purpose. And it's basically being looked at because the Transport Canada's uh, rule um, related to RPMs on icing says that you cannot fly uh, if you do not have an ice protection system or an ice, ice detector on your platform and there is a threat of icing in the atmosphere. So this is an example of the kind of tests that we've done. So we've taken a blade in the, on a test stand and the icing conditions and 
we've come up, we thought, well, okay, we have a, a hypothetical bar pass, it's 15 kilograms, that requires a certain amount of thrust to keep that hovering. And so we need to maintain that thrust, and it's, sorry. So with 37 newtons, we need to maintain that thrust out of each blade, and under certain icing conditions, we cannot maintain that thrust long enough to achieve a safe landing for that particular vehicle. Uh, so we moved on and we actually developed, well, how does that really relate to a full system? So we moved on and we developed uh, a small outdoor rig but with an icing capability. And uh, this is what you can see here. And um, we tested several bars under this rig. And so you can see this image here. This is kind of ice secretion that you get on, a, on a, the blades. And that, that was the ice that you got after following a failure. So the, the, the Alpines had to land. Um, and so if we can click on this video again. So this is an example of a small Alpaz under the ice and cloud on this outdoor rig. You can see this has been under the icing for a while. Um, you can see that the system becomes quite unstable. Ice is accreting on the, on the blades. And then it doesn't work so much. Um, so, where, as I mentioned, we were looking at different coatings, so lower adhesive coatings. And this is an example of what you can get if you put a, a low adhesive coating on a blade. So the, the orange line is the power increase uh, for an uncoated blade uh, on, a, on, a, on a single rotor. And you can see that the power increases quite rapidly following the onset of icing. But the blue line is a, a rotor blade that has actually been coated. And so this is going through a, a shed, a build and shed cycle and so the, that sort of sawtooth um, appearance of that curve is because you start seeing the, the shedding and, and building phase. So, but, but you can see it plateaus and you can maintain operation. So in summary, uh, we've been engaged at the NRC in icing work since the 1930s. We continue to develop uh, facilities um, and expand expertise and icing. This is because the demand related to new regulations that we are faced with. Um, we have our flight research lab at the airport in Ottawa. They are continuing to operate their Convair 580 aircraft um, um, in order to assess the atmosphere and judge the atmosphere in order to develop icing, um, understand icing conditions. And um, we are then having, also having to deal with the icing threat of new platforms such as our Paris and the urban air mobility platforms, uh, considering the icing threat that they may face. So, with that, thank you very much. Do you have any questions for Elvira? Uh, Thank you very much. Um, well, it's a question, maybe an obvious question, given the um, capability to simulate icing that you showed. But what's the future of actually physical icing rigs versus being able to simulate icing and not need to test? Well, that's a good question. Um, so, if we go back, so one of the, as I mentioned before, as I mentioned, with things like liquid, supercooled liquid water, SLD, supercooled large drops, the icing cloud in the wind tunnel may not be what the atmosphere sees. We, our drops might be too warm, they might not be moving at the right speed. Um, and so we don't know that the ice shapes or the development of ice protection systems in a wind tunnel is valid related to the natural environment. And so we're going to have to use simulations, not just not either one in isolation, they're going to have to start to be used together. So we can take our wind tunnels as far as we can with the confidence that we have what the answers is giving us. And in order to 
I believe, um, bridge that gap between what our wind cones can do and what we need to do for certification rooms. Simulations need to play a bigger role, and so we need to do certification by analysis, for example, in those cases. So it's not a case of, of the, they should always be done in conjunction with each other, but I think in order to meet the challenge with certification for SLD, it's going to have to play a bigger role with the two hand in hand. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, about the SLDs, so the new regulation was uh, introduced in 2015, I think, and it had previously uh, been a source of problems because of the flight that crashed. How come it took so long to have a new regulation on SLDs? <laughs> um, well, firstly, we needed to actually un understand the atmosphere. Um, and then, so there was lots of test flights done in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then there was some developing, like understanding that information. And then how, and if you look at the data from those flights, there was a lot of spread. And actually bringing that down to something that can be used or quantified with, you know, in a measurable way. And that's why, it, that's how it's been developed into those four cat categories. And so it's, it's work like that that took a long time and also, well, wind tunnels are not capable of meeting this and so should we bring this condition in yet? And so eventually it was, well, we've got to do this and so the rules are brought in and then the wind tunnels and other facilities have to catch up and, and develop that capability. Okay, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about the durability of the ice of the coatings? How long does it take to degrade and how, uh, sort of what do you think the future of other uh, small conditions? Um, yes, so you could have, you could have an excellent ice fabric coating or ice lower decent coating, but it might want to last once or twice. And there, in, There are very, there's lots, there's no standard way yet measuring ice adhesion or ice phobicity. And so it's based on an, an interpretation of how you're doing that to start with. But there's also no standard way of um, understanding or testing a durability. Is it UV? Is it rain? Is it humidity? Is it impact with rain and other contaminants in the, or contaminants in the atmosphere? So there needs to be standardisation. Um, I'm not answering your question. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so there is no, as I said, there's no, no decent coating that I'm good that's actually proven the durability, but that's obviously what we need to get there. But we, before we do that, we need to have a standard way of actually testing that durability and its isophobicity. Maybe we'll have time for one last question. Thank you, David, for your presentation. Uh, just would like to understand a little bit more about this uh, model that you have. Yes. To simulate icing. Is <coughs> that something so that was developed at the NRC? It was developed at the NRC, yeah. And uh, do you have any like papers that show this validation against the airfoils or, you know, any other uh, geometries than uh, the keto? Yes, so, yes, so this next slide is, anyway, so at the SAD Icing Conference in Vienna yep. from last year, there was an ice prediction workshop. I was there. Yeah, so, um, and so the ice prediction workshop is uh, an effort where there are a series of validation cases, experimental cases, um, and people use various icing codes in order to, to match those cases, and the, the Wolf Genetic Code was one of those. Yes. So you can go on that Ice Prediction Workshop website 
then find that validation case. Well, do you know also for, let's say, uh, like for glaze ice conditions, is, is, is the model that is, you know, correlates well with? Well, it looks nice. Yeah, but I'm more thinking about like a horn shape, you know, of the leading edge. Yes, it can do, it does the horn, does horn shapes. Um, one of the issues that the code did have, it was a single shot simulation. And so, if, once you develop an ice shape or an ice shape grows, the flow field that you have used in order to build that ice shape is no longer valid because it was based on a clean airflow. Uh, we have now developed this code, so it's a multi shot capability. So, at a certain time step, it will reanalyze the flow field. So, the ability to make, to do horn, ice, no, horn shapes is going to be improved. Actually, the difference between the this is an experimental and the red is the experiment, the blue is the simulation. The difference, the blue part on the, on the tip of the probe doesn't match very well because the heat transfer in the curve wasn't modelled correctly because it didn't have that multi shot capability. So that's still coming around. Then, yeah, I can, I can provide you some. Some uh, codes that we, yeah, sorry, some papers that we showed some validation. Maybe just a last question, very quickly. Is it the CPU uh, expensive? That was on the laptop. That was on the laptop. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, so, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, so now we can move to the next presentation. I would like to introduce you our next speaker. So uh, Dr. Grant is a Georgia Tech Aerospace Engineering graduate from the U US Army from the Watercraft Center. He has a 35 years career with Bell, including experimental testing and analytical method. In a seven years as segment at the PAX River Naval Air Station, he supported the veteran into flight testing with groundbreaking or on Vortex Ring State, for which he is a recipient of the Larry Bell Pioneer Award. In his current role at, as a senior te technical fellow, Dr. Brand provides technical oversight to program and support numerous company in initiative. He is a technical fellow of the Vertical Flight Society of 23 US patents. He is a 20, 20, 20, sorry, 2020 recipient of the Textron Chairman Award of Configuring Bell Farah to Wins. So I'm going to uh, tell you right up front, I'm not one of the authors on this paper, uh, but I was an editor. So uh, I can tell you about what uh, our uh, pilot, uh, uh, Stefan Honigan, uh, was doing and Ron Hofstetter, who was the aircraft lead uh, flight test engineer. And a little bit about the 525, uh, it is a 16 passenger clean sheet design transport category helicopter, so certified to part 29, maximum gross weight. 20,500 pounds, ready to move away from the mic. Um, it is a full authority fly-by-wire system. Um, if you don't know what fly-by-wire means, it's uh, the pilot's control sticks and pedals communicate to a computer, and the computer figures out what to do. Uh, every system on there that's critical is triplex, so we have uh, triple flight control computers, triple hydraulic systems, triple electrical generators, uh, and everything to uh, meet the requirements for new technology uh, with the FAA. Um, the ro main rotor is a five-blade articulated main rotor, uh, two uh, twin-engine general electric uh, engines, and a four-bladed, also articulated canted tail rotor. The tail rotor is uh, got about 10 and a half degrees of cant angle in it, and a, an RE100 APU so that you can Turn on your air conditioning, get your engines started uh, while you're on the ground and not run the big engines until you need them. All right, so I'll start with some general issues with uh, helicopter icing. The first one, you know, rotor blade accretes ice, and when it does, you get more drag, less CL max, and that's what a blade looks like in one condition where it has accreted some ice at the leading edge. Uh, it takes some time to build. Um, 
uh, and also um, the blades are going to accrete ice faster than the airframe because it's just they encounter more droplets per second. Um, uh, and then if you're going to be flying in these ice conditions, well, you, you still have to lift one G of weight. Your weight didn't change. And what you'll see as you start accreting ice is your torque is going to go up um, to, to handle that. And um, airspeed systems are another issue, uh, like you showed in the previous talk. Uh, if you don't do any protection on it, your keto probe could freeze over. That would be bad. Um, uh, other things, uh, that's a, an example of a different aircraft where it encountered some severe icing. Uh, you can get your windshields frozen over, you won't see where you're going. Uh, and then when this ice breaks loose, it can hit something, shed, cause damage. That's not allowed by the FAA, you're only allowed to have superficial damage. Uh, and also you got to make sure that your uh, ice chunks, nothing gets into the engine, cause damage to your engine or plug a filter if you have a, a filter. I'll show you what we have on the 525 with inlet barrier filters. So here's the effect of accreted ice on the aircraft. Uh, helicopter power uh, goes up. Um, the fuselage drag doesn't really change that much. Um, you know, it, it can accrue a little bit of ice on it, uh, change the drag a little, but it's also burning fuel, it's getting lighter. So um, that works to your advantage. Um, and then a couple of things to think about. Um, if you get ice on an airplane, you're flying at a high speed, and now you're encountering a power limitation, well, you can slow down in an airplane and keep going for a while. But on helicopters, you can never slow down the road. It's 100% RPM all the time. And so what happens when the rotor stays at 100% RPM, your torque's just going to go up until you, if you hit a limit, uh, an engine limit, and that's the only time when a rotor can droop. Not a good thing. Um, again, no appreciable weight gain because ice accretes, but fuel is burned. Burned fuel weighs nothing. Uh, and then some of the equipment uh, for ice protection, well, uh, the pitot tubes are all heated, even on the standard aircraft, the static ports. Uh, by the way, they're also triplexed, so uh, two pitot probes on the left side, one on the right side, and uh, that in case a bird hits it, you have system separation, all, of, all those things we had to think about. Um, main rotor system, <coughs> is uh, designed for de-ice, and I did talk about in a second, you know, preparing an aircraft for an icing uh, trial. You know, we got to install big generators to uh, provide electrical power to these heater systems. So the main rotor has a de-ice system, I'll we'll talk about that. Um, the tail rotor has an anti-ice system. Did I do that? <laughs> no way. Yeah, it's close, right there. So tail rotor has anti-ice, and I'll click through it. There you got it, thanks. And uh, for the engine inlet, there's a barrier filter, like your car has, a <coughs> cartridge up there. Uh, it filters out all the fine particles. Uh, and if you ever think the inlet filter's gonna get clogged, there's a bypass door to let air in, in case that happens. And then uh, some of the instrumentation on there, uh, there's an ice, a rate detector, and that system's uh, actually kind of an interesting thing. It's a little rod that vibrates at very high frequency, and when uh, water freezes on it, it gets heavier, and the frequency changes, and that's all correlated to, oh, you're accreting ice at a certain rate, and then you, you let a little bit of ice accrete on it so you know the rate, then you melt it off and let it keep going, and you, you can continually determine what the ice accretion rate is. So starting with the main rotor, um, you have a, a five uh, edge, on the leading edge you have five heater zones um, along the leading edge from almost from root to tip. And the way uh, the rotor system works, main rotor, ice is allowed to accrete at the leading edge for a certain time. It's based on the rate sensor. And Then when, once you have a certain amount of ice, the idea is hit the power, heat up um, the first zone um, on the 
the leading edge. It goes to all five blades, um, first zone of each blade, and then it cycles through them one at a time, one, two, three, four, five. And what your objective here is, is to melt the ice uh, where it contacts the metal. And that uh, all of a sudden becomes a very slick uh, surface, like a coating, uh, except it's melted water. And then the friend of the rotor is centrifugal force that will sling that ice off, and then you're free, and you keep going. The tail rotor is a little bit different. Um, that is a continuous uh, blade heating system, and it puts in enough heat all the time to, to prevent ice from ever forming. And there's a couple of reasons for that that I'll get into. Um, you know, number one, if you do this, you don't have to worry about asymmetric shedding. One blade sheds the ice and the other one didn't, and now it's shaking. And tail rotors spin at much higher RPM than the main rotor, so you could get more vibration, whereas a main rotor that has asymmetric shedding, it's 256 RPM, who cares? Um, they, they won't have a problem. Um, we have two independent ice rate sensors, so we can get a good signal. I already told you how it works, um, and they, they, uh, they, they provide the information so that the system has done its own calculations and it knows what should the cycling be, how often should I uh, send a heat cycle to the main rotor. And next thing we can talk about is electrical power load. Um, like I said, we do have to put in uh, bigger generators in the aircraft to handle if you're going to fly into known icing conditions. And this is where you, where you start to think about, well, why, did, why don't we just do continuous heating on the main rotor blade? Well, this is why it's a much larger surface area. And you want to keep that big blade, five blades heated the whole time, you're going to need an even bigger generator. So the right technology for a main rotor is uh, let the ice accrete and then uh, put on heat and then shed the ice. And what you have to think about, too, on, on a main rotor, when you know its rotor plane is like this, and uh, if I'm flying in that direction, my tip path plane is tilted like this, and I'm coning on the rotor. So where does the ice shed? Nowhere on the fuselage. It misses everything. So uh, having ice shed uh, is not a problem for the main rotor. Whereas the tail rotor, um, it's kind of vertical, and its target is the entire fuselage, so you don't want to shed ice mm -hmm. onto your airframe. Um, so the strategy for the main rotor is try to heat it up very quickly so that you get that uh, water, uh, you break the bond between the ice and the metal, you know, don't put in so much heat that you melt your composite blade, uh, and then when you get that uh, ice bond uh, to break, centrifugal force is just going to shed that. And on the other hand, if you don't put enough power in and you just do a slow heat, you can just generate a you know, more, more melted ice. And so you try to do this all at the right sequence. So just, just enough to break the bond and then shed the chunk of ice and keep going. You don't want a situation where we've created a lot of liquid water, then it runs back and it can freeze again where there's no ice protection. So you know, all our ice protection is focused on the leading edge where we know that ice secretes. <coughs> Um, again, no more than cosmetic damage is allowed uh, for the regulations. Um, main rotor's ice misses the airframe. Tail rotor ice, uh, it would tra the trajectory would hit the airframe. That's why it's continuously heated, never gets ice on it. And it's small enough that, that you can afford the power to do that. And you don't get any vibration from the tail rotor uh, if you have it continuously heated. And separately, you got to make sure the engines are protected as well. So how does this all start? Uh, we can go to an icing research tun tunnel, NASA Glenn for us, um, and we started with sort of the critical assemblies on top, on the roof of the aircraft. The, the entire system up there is modeled. Um, we, we're going to look at uh, how's flow going into the engine, uh, or is any ice getting in there, uh, the APU, the cooling systems, uh, the flow inside the system, we have all the flowers to model the representative flow rates of these things, and then we confirm that all the systems are functioning properly. Um, you can kind of see uh, this example where 
Uh, we're looking at the inlet barrier filters. So this is like the cartridge to prevent fog from getting in your engine or fine particles. Um, and what, what we actually found in testing is that uh, even though you have that much ice on the inlet engine inlet barrier filter there, it still uh, wasn't bothering the engine flow. It's kind of uh, interesting that it works that way. Um, but we still had to verify that, you know, if in some event that we, we couldn't simulate, if it got completely closed, we showed that that filter, the, uh, the bypass store, would still work. And in fact, they had to trick it into working by they, they covered the inlet barrier filter with plastic so that it was, it was blocked and then you develop enough differential pressure and then the bypass door will open. And you show that with the door open, you're not letting any ice into the system that might damage the engine. So there, there are manufacturer limits for how much it can tolerate. Some of the other testing done at the IRT, uh, early assessment of uh, some of the blades, main rotor, tail rotor, and you just look at like what is what are the ice shapes going to be for certain things. And we measure them, and uh, some of the reasons you would measure them is like a failed ice condition. You know, if your heater breaks um, on your helicopter while you're in flight, uh, what what kind of an accretion would you get? What would the penalties be? And um, um, they would look at things like blade temperature versus time. They're going to assess a lot of cases for this to see how much power do you need to get rid of this ice. The only limitation here is you, centrifugal force is not here to be your friend. There's nothing to shed the ice or pull it away. So it's a, a little bit of a limitation, but you can see what the ice shape is going to look like. Uh, one of the last tests, they also want to check the landing gear. You know, you, there could be a scenario where we put the gear down and we had to do a go around and you accreted some crazy amount of ice like that. And they just showed that you could uh, still retract the gear, move, swing the gear with uh, that amount of ice on. And um, that's what it would look like. And some of the, before you get ready for flight test, uh, you have to demonstrate a couple things. Can we restart the engine or the APU uh, while, while our inlet barrier filter is iced up? We would also look at some of the simulations we did, uh, other areas of the airframe that are not treated. There's no heater on the nose. We just accrete the ice and accept it um, as an additional drag um, because it's just not worth putting the extra equipment on there for that. Um, and once you're done, if you have a simulated ice shape, um, you would we would actually bond it to the nose of the aircraft for uh, warm weather testing. You, you know, we fly around in Fort Worth in the summer, try to see what our ice is going to look like and see if, if there's any impact. And mainly what you're concerned with here is, you know, we've put something on the front of the aircraft and uh, is there any effect on the pitot probes or the static pressure probes? You want to make sure your airspeed's not affected by the expected ice that you're going to get. And um, some of the roughness, you, you can see that. Uh, this is an example of an ice shape that's predicted with the horns this time. Uh, and the horn shape bonded onto the uh, horizontal tail in the back of the aircraft is shown there. So we'll fly around with uh, you know, horizontal stabilizer and go, like, what kind of airfoil is that? Yeah, that's the icing shape. And you just verify that you know, your, your handling qualities aren't uh, terribly degraded. Uh, and, and I should say too, um, the, the horizontal tail surface, um, it's, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a flight critical thing. It does, you know, obviously help the aircraft stay pointed in the correct direction. But if it accretes ice, um, you can still fly it. And for that reason, we don't go to the expense and weight and the power of let's keep the leading edge of the horizontal tail if the aircraft can fly perfectly fine with this shape on the back. So uh, once you do all that pre-work, your predictions, your uh, uh, tunnel tests, uh, you, you've got to start planning a campaign. So a campaign uh, can go for a couple of years generally. 
And for this particular test, it started in September 2021. You modify the aircraft, gets its generators, gets uh, a heater blankets, all that stuff gets installed, and then all your instrumentation to measure this stuff has to go in. I'll show you more of that in a second. Uh, and ultimately, we did complete in this uh, one winter 140 flight test events, 154 hours flown, and 36 of them were behind that uh, spray rig, the tanker, the hiss. And uh, it, the people who operate the HISS, uh, our Redstone Test Center, uh, there's the JRC 12G, I'm going to call that the Chase aircraft. That aircraft's responsible for sort of supervising if anything's going wrong, and they photo document all the ice shapes that are accruing on the aircraft as we fly. And then the CH 47F is the HISS, that's the helicopter spray rig system. It's one of a, one of a kind. And those guys have all their systems calibrated, you know, to generate the liquid water, the droplet size, the water content. Uh, it's all calibrated so they know what they're putting in the air. And um, as far as the logistics offsite, you know, you're, you're in cold weather, like, like I feel like I am right now, but uh, you got to uh, get all your spare parts flow uh, there because you're pretty far away from your logistics center. Uh, you're looking for heated hangar facilities. Uh, you got to provide lodging for all your people and your vehicles. Um, uh, these are the kinds of things you got to have flight test, uh, engineering, maintenance crew, all their uh, equipment for swapping out parts. Um, you need your airport support people there, keep the pavement clear of ice and snow. And then we found out that the local talent was much better at predicting what, what the next weather event was going to be. So uh, we thought that was really helpful. Uh, and then the actual aircraft instrumentation for this, the, the one item on the right side of the aircraft is the cloud combination program. That measures the liquid water content and droplet size, so you know what kind of a cloud you're operating in. And a lot of cameras all over the place because what you're looking for is ice shedding. Did, where did the ice go? What did it hit? Uh, the high speed camera to look at ice getting shed from the rotor blades. Um, inside the aircraft, we had a flight test engineering station so that uh, we could have engineers in the aircraft looking at things real time. Sometimes they would fly, you know, so far away that you didn't necessarily have a good TM link and the telemetry room you know, that's based, they, they just don't have the situational awareness of someone in the back. So uh, that was set up that way. And then this is uh, how the spray rig system is set up. So the hiss is gonna be the controlled water release. And uh, if you look close, you'll see the, um, uh, the aircraft's gonna try to enter that cloud and it's going to try to maintain a distance. So the helicopter up front, the CH-47, has these red lights, and they're connected to a radar system. And pilots complained that um, it was binary. It was either green or red. So <laughs> here it's red, so they're too close. And they'll try to back off uh, a little bit from that. And, uh, and it's a lot uh, of things going on here. So you're are uh, highly concentrated and uh, there's always three aircraft in the air. So I say there's a lot going on both in the air and on the ground and to try to give you an indication of that. You know, there's the chase aircraft all in pro close proximity and this is getting filmed from the hiss. So you really got to pay attention to a lot of things. Um, what you're trying to do now is uh, get your aircraft. The, the aircraft is so big, you, the hiss cloud is not going to uh, be able to fit in there. So you do one zone at a time, and you kind of move through this. Um, eventually, you would like to get into um, natural icing so that the full aircraft gets immersed all at once. But meantime, you do the zone at a time. And this is kind of what it looks like. Get the, the aircraft gets in position. The, Pilots know right away I'm in the downwash of the hiss. A lot more power is needed because you're essentially flying uphill in the wake of that other helicopter. And some of the things we observed after entering the cloud, you could see, you know, the IVF, not a lot of accumulation there. 
horizontal stabilizer way less than we predicted. A lot of that has to do with the fact that you're dumping a lot of heat from your engines back there. So um, we were conservative in our predictions. Almost no ice on the vertical fin. And they actually had to turn down the wattage on the tail rotor because um, it didn't get cold enough. There's an ice shedding event, just so you can see. Airframe does accrete ice. We watched the chunks go away, make sure it didn't hit anything. Uh, some of the rotor blade uh, ice chunks flying off. A lot of times the pilot would say we saw chunks fly forward and then they'd come back, uh, back at us. They could actually detect that. But no, nothing unusual happened. And here's an example of ice shedding uh, from the nose, hits the knife, and uh, no damage seen. There's a other view of it, just a chunk, you know, breaking loose and um, slides up the aircraft and shatters. Um, small thing, the landing light did freeze up because it's an LED light. The old lights were uh, incandescent, but that hot. And here's our lessons learned, you know, uh, be available and ready for opportunities. You have a lot limited time airborne because the Hiss only has so much water in it. And uh, so you're spraying that and you got to be mindful of that. Uh, you need good communication, three aircraft in the air at one time, uh, a lot going on. So uh, communication is critical and safety, obviously paramount. Um, you want to make sure you can handle these types of emergencies and uh, have good communication, you know, after you, every flight, you know, what, what is our lesson learned from this flight? Let's not do that next time. And here's our plan for the future. Next step, we gotta do a little bit more HISS testing with the 525. Uh, we gotta get the FAA in the cockpit with us and do natural icing and maybe we'll get to do that this winter. So that's all I got. Thank you. So these are the authors on the full paper, and there's the test team. So I acknowledge that that group did a great job. So thanks again. So. <laughs> I had a question. The um, the icing cycle that you described for the main rotor. Yeah. Does that have some meaningful impact on the fatigue life of any of those structures? <laughs> no, I mean you're not you're not trying to get you're just trying to melt up the ice bond, so it, you, it gets hotter than that on the tarmac in Texas. So, thank you. Is there any uh, design consideration on ice uh, rate sensor? Placement of it. That's very Where it's placed? Yeah. Um, because they say that in all along you won't be moved through ice, so the ice free detector would actually not ice too. I mean, we, we try to put it in a place where, um, you know, if, if any ice gets on it, it doesn't um, interfere with the static pressure probes, but it's in a pretty clean area. It's not being blocked by anything. And that's pretty much all you need to have for that um, that system. So, and then you, you sort of calibrate that ice detector with the whole system, and eventually it gets certified with the ice detectors where you had them, and that becomes part of the icing configuration. So it's all calibrated as one system. Thank you. Oh, on, 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 on an helicopter, how many, I would say, what's the percentage of flights that are done in IC? Statistically, do you have an idea? Boy, I don't know. Um, depends who the operator is, like North Sea, we expect to, you know, sell these aircraft there. In the winter, it might be every day they're going to have the system on. Uh, obviously, on a clear day, you wouldn't, but, you know, they, they plan to operate. You know, and then, you know, it might be ice there, turn on the system. So, or at least it's going to be ready to go because you're, you're not going to turn it on unless the ice detectors see something. And the secondary thing to that is, you know, well, what if the ice detectors aren't 
doing the right thing. The, we make sure that the pilot can see that ice is accreting just by the systems on the windshield. That's one of the initial checks we do. But it's hard to tell, you know, the operators that are going to operate there are going to have that equipment. If you're operating in the Gulf of Mexico, probably not. Thank you. Um, no, it's not going to be a tough question. Okay. <laughs> Softball. But, so first, all, I'm, I'm really impressed by uh, how much you know about ice from mm -hmm. uh, being in Texas. But <laughs> um, I grew up on Long Island, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I was just wondering you know, how much this testing methodology has been used in the industry in general uh, for that class of aircraft. Well, um, probably, you know, our competitors do this. The S-92 would have its icing systems. Um, you know, they're, they're all validated and they, they keep going. They, if it's uh, ice up ahead, they will fly through it and encounter it and deal with it. Um, with our military aircraft, we will do the same thing. We, you know, B-22 is good for flight and known icing as its systems do. They're all kind of similar. You put heating zones on the blades, um, you look elsewhere, is there going to be an issue somewhere? You know, the, the wing, for instance, of the B-22 has a boot that inflates, like more like a fixed wing aircraft. Um, but same same kind of principles. Thank you. Welcome. Are you able to scenario all of the flight envelope with the hiss or are there certain places where there's like the water content or the MPD is off or are you able, able to hit it exactly or very close to? So I suspect we can, they, they, they're calibrated to, they can give you whatever you want. Our, our big problem is you, you can't do the whole aircraft at once. And so and eventually mm -hmm. we do have to go find a cloud and, and hopefully you try to find the cloud that um, is Maybe the worst case one would be ideal, but you take whatever you can get and then you try to get overlap and um, maybe um, if you're unlucky, you gotta do another icing season and come back again. So that, that's happened in the past. Don't be Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Jeff. Is ice accumulation on the lower part of the aircraft deemed less critical and the, the question behind the question is for firefighting operations there are a couple, a couple parts of the world where you get winter fire seasons and those water tanks can accumulate a whole lot of ice I'm wondering what your thoughts are on whether that should be something that needs to be tested and designed into a, 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 an add-on system like that so uh, as add-on systems go like if you look at this picture behind me um, I don't have a mouse with me but uh, Everything that we anticipate ever putting on an icing aircraft is on that aircraft right now. There's a, like a big bubble window on the side in the back of the aircraft. There's like a loud hailer, all this equipment, antennas that you might possibly have. They're not real. They're like just shapes to accrete ice to see if there's a problem. And if there's not, you're, you're good to go. Um, water bombing tanks, I don't think we, we plan to have that for icing conditions. Hey, it's icing and there's a fiber we want to put out. Um, probably not. Thank you for your presentation. Well, uh, my question is, do you have to validate the main motor for SLB conditions? So, I'm not the icing expert. I, you know what what they decide that they're going to do. Uh, they will have a plan for that that meets the certification regs. If that's part of the regs, then I'm sure that they're going to do that. Or um, they will make an argument that no matter what the droplet is, the heat, the system is going to shed it if it freezes. So. Okay. Thank you. Do you have another question? Well, this is my question. It's a idea for both speakers. <laughs> right. So, uh, I, I guess we talked about heating the blade, mentioned the expanding boom. Yeah. 
um, surface, you know, slippery surfaces. Um, are there any other technologies well, that are emerging? The coating would be great, but you know, rotor blades, even the the tight the titanium or uh, nickel erosion gets beat up by sand, and like the coatings, they just don't last on helicopters. The you know the environment that the helicopter right if you land on a tarmac that has snow and <laughs> the, the drop the ice particles hitting just that alone can cause damage on a leading edge. So uh, if you can make a coating survive that. That'd be great. Might they might work on like yeah you know if nose if the nose we didn't want to have ice and creep on there for some reason could put, could put a coating on it that'd be great like the aircraft the windshield the entire windshield is heated yeah. so that um, it won't get ice on it but if you could do it with a coating that that'd be great thank you yeah yes maybe this would be the, the last question. Thank you. Are you considering over condition for icing? Over? Yeah. It's not not really. I mean, you're, you know, if, if you're in icing conditions in hover, you just probably wouldn't take off and, and go. Um, but I'm not sure. You know, the, to me, there's no reason the system wouldn't work in a hover. You should be able to turn it on. It detects ice accretion, and then it just sheds it. I'm more thinking for the engine with the side inlet, it's giving good separation efficiency and so much water going to the, to the engine but over it's really like the water going directly into the engine well um they do they do tests like that like in the wind tunnel they can slow it down do check it in different situations um, and what does the inner barrier filter do for different air speeds so some of that data will just be naturally um if you want to just find out from Again, in the end, the, the, the bypass door can open up and just open <coughs> free flowing air to the engine. And it's not a direct path, so the air would have to go through curves. And then, even the basic engine has a, a particle separator in it. So, um, thank you. Yes. So, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. All right. As for our upcoming events, uh, there is the Maritime Helicopter Challenge uh, at uh, General Dynamics. This uh, event might take place and we'll know soon if the event will take place and uh, the, when the date will be. And we have the Forum 80 as well in uh, May in Montreal. And uh, if you're a student and you would like to, uh, to join, uh, the local chapter has free passes, so reach out to us and uh, register before April, uh, April 11th. Thank you very much, everyone, to uh, come tonight to uh, our event, and I will invite the speakers on stage. <laughs> Thank you very much for being our speakers tonight. Oh, thank you.